Uh, well, we're all set, and I'm really excited to welcome our, our first speaker. We are delighted to have uh, Nick Newman, Senior Research Associate at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Nick and I have shared many conversations about audio, technology, and product over the years, so he's absolutely the right person to, to kick off this summit and to talk about what's next for us in the field of audio and voice. He's been studying this now, well, for a very long time, but for the last three years, he's been really uh, working on a report, looking into everything from audiograms to voice to podcast. So Nick, uh, good morning, and I'm gonna pass over to you now to, to tell us what's next in audio and voice. Good morning, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, thanks, Adam, and, and like you, and like David, uh, I actually started my career working in radio before moving to online for many years. And, it, and um, you know, it is just really exciting now to see audio being reborn for the digital age and the sort of creativity that we're seeing in formats and in opportunities for both small and large publishers. So at the Reuters Institute, uh, as Adam says, we're just about to publish a new report on digital audio. It'll be our third in the last few years. And in this presentation, I'm going to draw on different aspects of that research and touch hopefully on many of the themes that I know will be picked up in more detail at sessions over the next few days. So we'll look at uh, why digital audio is taking off, why now. We'll obviously explore the growth of podcasting and why daily news has become such a critical genre. I'll talk about some of the opportunities in short form and interactive audio as well, and then look at how platforms are likely to shape much of what happens over the next few years. And, and I'll also talk about the impact of coronavirus, obviously, on news podcasting. Uh, that's a big part of the report that I'm currently writing uh, and will be published next month. So firstly, some data from our digital news report, which shows that podcasting is truly a worldwide phenomenon. So on average, uh, across 20 countries, most of these are in Europe, around a third of us are now accessing at least one podcast every month. Uh, having said that, some markets are uh, particularly hot, such as the US in terms of audience, yes. Uh, so 100% growth in the last five years in the US, but also in terms of innovation. Uh, and then the UK is also starting to pick up speed with a proportion using podcasts up 50% uh, or so in the last two years. It's also worth uh, pointing out that much of this growth is coming from younger demographics. So here you can see that 18, 20 to 24s are four times more likely to access than over 55s. And this is very much the sort of plugged in generation. It's the combination of the smartphone and headphones uh, which has really taken a lot of the friction away from listening to audio. And many of these younger listeners are engaging deeply for very long periods of time. So our research shows three sort of core reasons why this is happening. So firstly, convenience. Uh, audio is just incredibly easy to consume. You don't have to look at a screen, for example. It just sort of washes over you, as this person says. Uh, and obviously, you can consume audio while you're doing something else. Secondly, uh, control. So you don't have a scheduler telling you what to listen to, when to listen to it. You can choose. And then finally, uh, and this is really important, sort of diversity of voices and perspectives. So podcasts tend to be uh, less stuffy in tone than traditional radio, uh, but also in terms of the range of guests. And this really appeals to, to some of these younger demographics as well. But technology is not done yet. Uh, we continue to see advances in hardware and software focused on the audio sector. Uh, headphones are developing all the time. They're getting better. They have sort of noise cancelling, which I think is an important feature not to be underestimated. They also, in many cases, have voice activation now built into them, again, taking some of that friction away. You have millions of new uh, smart speakers going to people's homes. Um, uh, about a fifth of households now in the UK and US, for example. And then thirdly, you've got integration coming into cars. So Apple Play, Android, Auto, all the rest of it. And I think a lot of this technology combined with higher quality original content is pushing audio into a new golden age. So if we look uh, first at the opportunities um, for podcasts and daily news podcasts, we can see that, first of all, 
there is uh, a huge number. There is exponential growth. So this is the production. Something like 200,000 new podcast shows being produced every year, according to Chartable. Uh, Apple itself said in April that it par- its directory passed the 1 million mark for the first time, which is just kind of awesome, but also very challenging in terms of how you get your shows discovered. Uh, you can see there how Serial, the true crime podcast in 2014, was a sort of real trigger, a, a sort of global hit, millions of listeners. And it gave a lot of publishers, I think, the confidence to get into the, the idea of native podcasting. Uh, and then you can see the daily in 2017 as well. But this is podcasts in general. So what what proportion of these podcasts are are news? So in the research we did last year, we found that just 6% are news. So that's around, uh, today, it's around 90,000 news podcasts. If we look at um, the Apple episode charts, though, broadly based on consumption, we can see that news makes up something like 20% of the top shows in the US, for example, and similar in parts of Europe as well. So news is really punching above its weight with a relatively small number of shows being listened to proportionately much more. In the US, uh, we also have, and many countries in Europe as well, we have aggregated publisher data. This is PodTrack. And I was just looking at the charts yesterday for September. It shows the number one publisher uh, podcast in the US is The Daily. The New York Times itself says something like 3 million people now listen to it every day. And then two NPR news shows right at the top in terms of total listening. But uh, we can't all be The Daily. We can't all be The New York Times. But as we discovered last year, when we categorized the most publisher, most popular publisher generated podcasts across five countries, there are many, many different types of podcast and many different types of opportunities. So this chart shows that overall, uh, the biggest category we found was an interview talk show. So these tend to be uh, fairly cheap to produce. There's a huge number of them. Uh, And then you have the second biggest block there is um, what we're calling episodic series. Uh, So especially in the US and and Australia, where true crime is a big thing, you can see 51% of the podcasts we tracked in Australia were true crime. Then documentaries, so other documentaries and daily news shows, relatively small number of those. But as we've already mentioned, they they punch above their weight at the top end of the charts. And then there's a few long reads as well. So people reading out essentially text articles. In terms of who's producing the content, from a publisher point of view, you have uh, sort of print and digital born brands. This, by the way, is an, a, a huge overgeneralization, but you have print and digital born brands doing sort of more unscripted uh, talk shows, interview shows. It's kind of really reusing the talents of the newsroom, uh, something that they can do alongside other work. Uh, This example is Giles Corrin at The Times. Ezra Klein Show is one of 200 podcasts now being produced by Vox in the US. And then broadcasters are also doing unscripted, but proportionately, more of their top shows are scripted documentaries. So reusing the skills, uh, in, if you like, that they already have in-house. So examples here, the BBC hit Tunnel 29, uh, and then uh, a- ABC in, in, in Australia as, as well. Uh, of course, broadcasters do unscripted shows like uh, Newscast and America Cast, and print is increasingly moving into documentaries. So many of these sort of early um, uh, insights are, are probably breaking down now. If we look at daily news uh, specifically, uh, this is an updated chart from a report. Uh, We'll be releasing this in a few weeks' time, so I haven't put the exact numbers on it. Uh, But we've identified almost 100 different daily news shows now across six countries. And a few years ago, there there were zero. So that's more than 30 extra shows compared with this time last year. Uh, and we've had, uh, just as examples, we've had a new launch from France Info in the last few weeks, Danish Radio, uh, DR, public broadcaster, launched a new daily podcast at the height of the coronavirus crisis, the Times of London, similarly. Apple News has launched uh, a daily podcast, the first by uh, a major platform. And then if we subdivide this category further, we did further analysis looking at the length of these, we can sort of detect three different types of daily news podcasts. So at the bottom, we have something we're calling micro bulletins. So these tend to be news on demand, uh, maybe one to five minute uh, bulletins. They include 
BBC Minute, for example, NPR News Now, much of this is aimed at, as I say, at voice devices, but they're also available as podcasts. Then in the middle, you have uh, mid-length news updates, often three or four items, uh, looking to update people in a very concise way on the news of the day. So there's Omnipod in Sweden, uh, you have Up First uh, from National Public Radio, very good examples. And then you have this sort of deep dive, so one subject at length, uh, this is where, uh, you know, the Daily pioneered this, but you have Code Source from Le Parisien, um, Les Echo, you have uh, the Intelligence from the Economist today in focus from The Guardian. Uh, average length for these tends to be around 25 minutes, but you can see there's quite a range. Uh, it's worth pointing out that in terms of, you know, how you do these things, these programs are not for the faint-hearted. So um, New York Times says The Daily now has 15 dedicated staff as part of a wider audio team now of, of more than 30. The Guardian the Economist around eight, some shows um, around four or five, and I've just listed there the kinds of roles that come up uh, most, most frequently. So uh, many of them involve specific broadcast skills like presenters, uh, sound engineers, sound designers. Uh, these are different skills and often very different from radio too. Uh, you can see Aftonblad in Sweden has an even leaner model, so just two people, although, um, of course, they have access to the whole newsroom as well. And for smaller publishers in smaller countries, it is harder to justify a dedicated team, not least because there's a lot less advertising revenue available. So what about that business side? Uh, well, the intelligence for The Economist, which has been going um, you know, just over a year, maybe 18 months, has a weekly audience of well over half a million. They listen to two to three episodes a week. Uh, they also say the show is profitable and there's been you know, a huge amount of interest from blue chip advertisers um, over the last 12 months. That was obviously before coronavirus, but in the last few weeks I've been talking to publishers and it's really striking how they say that the revenue has actually held up extremely well. In most cases, it's above the level before the pandemic. This is not the case everywhere. So in Denmark, for example, uh, Politiken, which makes a daily news podcast, has found it much harder to get traditional advertisers interested. So that may just be a lag or it may be that smaller countries are ultimately going to follow uh, a different path. And interestingly, Politiken has bundled its daily podcast uh, for a number of days a week as part of its wider digital subscription, which I think is a really interesting experiment. We'll probably see more of that. So we know that COVID-19 has hugely affected news habits and consumption everywhere. So how, how has that affected podcasts in particular? Well, this is uh, the picture in France, and this data comes from, from Acast, and it's aggregated across their network. And you can see that before the epidemic, so that's the yellow line, uh, Podcasts have had a very, very distinct cons consumption peak. So early in the morning, uh, coinciding obviously with that commuting peak. And you can see the effect of the lockdowns. So that's the green line. So this is in May. And you can see how everything is really flattened out. So listening is happening, starts a bit later, uh, but is much more evenly spaced through the day. And uh, and then we can also see beyond that, how, and then you've got a second peak in the early evening. Uh, you can also see how the different genres were affected. This chart comes from the United States. The data comes from PodTrack. And you can see what happened. This really just looks at the period going into the lockdown in March. And you can see that in that first few weeks, all genres uh, dipped initially. News is the red line. And you can see how that started to rise again. And... Um, it's definitely held up better than some of those other categories like sport and entertainment. And publishers I've talked to say that news podcasting is in pretty much all cases back to pre-COVID listening or in many cases much higher than pre-COVID listening because of the interest in the story. So part of the reason for that is we've seen publishers launching a whole load of new podcasts specifically designed to address intense interest in the crisis. So the launch of these sort of pop-up coronavirus podcasts, many of them you can see here presented by experts and trying to explain this very complicated story. So um, CNN had a huge hit with Dr. Sanjay Gupta, a medical expert, uh, quite a famous example from Christian Drosten, epidemiologist, 
who helped uh, anchor this show from Germany's public broadcast to NDR, which proved hugely popular at the height of the crisis. And in our digital news report, uh, many of our respondents felt that podcasts like these were able to provide more depth and more understanding than other kinds of media. So I focused a lot on podcasts because that's where a lot of the action is today. Uh, but digital audio is, of course, much more than that. And at the beginning of this year, we asked more than 200 leading publishers about their most important audio initiatives. And we can see that for uh, for, for uh, most of them, it was around daily uh, podcasts of different kinds or different kinds of podcasts, chat, chat podcasts, serialized podcasts. But then short form content for voice de devices was important for around a third. And you can see about a quarter there planning to try and turn their text articles into audio, so text to speech. Just some quick examples on the left here, you have the Globe and Mail in Canada, one of many publishers that now often offer a player embedded in their mobile site uh, where you can read the story in different languages, taking advantage of the synthesized voices. On the top right, you have a Brazilian newspaper which has been getting journalists to read out individual stories and then turn them into a sort of Spotify playlist. Uh, you also have Apple reading about 20 selected stories. So human read these are as part of the Apple News Plus product. Uh, and then of course, Google has launched a new service in the US which creates this playlist of different individual stories. So atomized news from different news brands. So you get a national brand uh, like this, national story like this, and then that might be followed uh, with an algorithm that knows where you are that maybe brings you one from Minneapolis, for example, a local one. Uh, and this is something that Google is paying selected publishers for. And you can see really working well in a voice search environment where you're looking for additional information about a particular story or a particular development. So this is definitely one area in which audio is likely to develop over the next few years. On the other hand, uh, publishers really worry that in this scenario, it is going to be the platforms. It will be Google in this case that gets the credit and their brand that produced the story that invested in the journalism will be will be forgotten. And not only that, some broadcasters see the increasing power of platforms in this area as something of an existential crisis. And they're obviously trying to build their own destinations, their own apps. Uh, they're trying to build their own playlist functionality, their own personalized experiences as well. So you see uh, Swedish radio, um, national public radio in the US, really investing a lot in some of the same kind of techniques and trying to build that direct relationships. So some publishers have withdrawn content. So it's been hard to get BBC podcasts, for example, on some smart speakers. Uh, and it's going to see, it's gonna be very interesting to see how some of these tensions uh, play out. So just a quick recap uh, of the main points then. So digital audio is a rare growth story uh, due to uh, the flexibility of the medium, the intimacy, the quality of the content, uh, very much driven by these new technologies that we talked about. Uh, and the content itself increasingly sounds different to something you might hear on the radio, and that needs thinking about. Secondly, uh, we're still at the early stages. We're still some way, I think, from peak audio. I think there's plenty of room for innovation, especially in Europe, uh, where things are, are, are developing um, but are behind the US, which is more mature. If anything, COVID-19 has accelerated change. Uh, it doesn't seem to have slowed growth at all. Success requires a clear strategy, a clear focus. It will be important to create valuable and distinctive native propositions, and also to learn uh, by listening to audiences and adapting content accordingly. And then finally, increasingly distribution, discovery, these are gonna become the key challenges in audio. Uh, all those podcasts out there, how do you get yours find? Um, and it will be really important for bigger publishers, obviously, but especially for those smaller publishers. Here's just a reminder of some of the research that we've done, it's all available free from the Reuters Institute uh, website, uh, one on voice, one on news podcasts, and in a month or so, we'll publish uh, one specifically looking at daily news, and the impact of COVID-19. Uh, thank you very much. Very happy to, to take uh, questions. Thank you.
Hi. Yes, we have uh, so far one question from Ellie LFC92. Uh, she says that is super curious about what journalists and consumers thinks about apps and you like uh, Curio. I mean, uh, she said she, uh, she haven't tried yet, but see it all the time on my feed. Yeah, so this is the idea of uh, stories that are read out. So we have Curio, um, News Over Audio, Noah. Um, I mentioned Apple News in the presentation. So, you know, this is essentially taking text articles and getting actors or journalists themselves to, to read them. And uh, apps like Curio are trying to do this as part of a paid subscription. Um, so at the moment, these are still relatively niche. Not that many people are, are subscribing to them. Um, but I think it's, it's really interesting. I think the difficulty for publishers is do they allow that content to be aggregated in somebody else's app, or do they want to try and build that into a sort of premium layer within their own content so the economist for example has the red version as part of the of its core subscription so i think what's happening at the moment is we're getting a lot of experimentation as people don't know whether that's going to be something important or not and so they are allowing some of their content to be sampled as a way of sort of learning uh, whether this is valuable or not thank you uh, we have here a question from corinne potger Corinne asks, a podcast uh, was, a, I mean, were a big topic at Asia Media Conference all summer. It's been suggested in the past that it might be an Anglophone phenomenon. Are we seeing a change in that? Uh, yes, I mean, I think from the data I showed you, I mean, there's absolutely no question. I mean, the US is still way ahead in terms of penetration, but also just the sophistication, the ad market, you know, it's just developing much more slowly. But in the last couple of years, we've really seen that change. I mean, the UK has picked up enormously in the uh, um, both from listening point of view, and th and that is partly being fueled by content itself and publishers looking at this opportunity and wanting to get an early, wanting to get that early moving advantage. And to answer Corinne's point, I mean, we're we're definitely seeing growth in other parts of the world as well. Africa is a huge growth area. Asia to Latin America. Um, Brazil is one of the fastest growing uh, podcast markets with very substantial numbers for um, podcasts from, from Globo, for example, one of the major uh, publishers. So as I said right at the top, I think this is becoming a global phenomenon. And I think the reason is that it's just a great um, way of consuming content. And the, the, the lack of friction, the combination of the smartphone and the headphones is happening everywhere. It's not just happening in the United States. We have uh, another question from Ole Tharekson from uh, Swedish Radio. Ole is speaking also tomorrow at uh, this summit. And Ole asked the new Google News Audio Initiative in the US, have they partnered up with a lot of publishers? So that, that is hard to answer because a lot of those publishers are under NDA and a lot of that is happening in the US. But yes, there are obviously a number of publishers who, are, who have signed up to that and are taking part. And as far as I understand it, those conversations are going on and Google are planning to bring that service to, to Europe as well. And as I said before, I think this is really interesting because it's a different model. Some of that sort of some of the short form uh, audio in particular is very hard to monetize through advertising. So I think we might see some different models here, which may be about licensing content, which is essentially what Google is doing um, with, with that product, or um, you know some other sort of subscription services or bundling those things into your wider subscription. So for really short form audio, I think the monetization models may be different from podcasts where advertising works really well, low ad density and uh, high levels of consumer acceptance. So we have here a comment from Chris Talvi. So Chris Talvi says the issue is curation now. There are podcasts with unique enough niches to find an audience, but anything in politics, news, economics is going to face an insane barrier to discovery. What do you think, Nick? Yeah, I think the issue is, is discovery. Um, and the issue in podcasts, as anyone who's been involved in podcasts from the early days knows that's been the problem. Uh, I think there will be many ways of of discovery curation editorial curation will be one uh, obviously word of mouth is is, is currently it algorithms are, are, are pushing you know spotify's algorithms or apple's algorithms all, all of these things will be important um but yes this this is the critical thing but i think for any algorithm the key is to have something to say and to have a distinctive proposition if you have that everything else kind of kicks in it's very hard to make a successful product um 
you know, if, if, if you don't have something that people really, really want to listen to, really want to come back to again and again, because that's the beauty of the podcast uh, uh, um, format. So thank you, Nick. Thank you so much for your time today and for this insightful presentation. I mean, really helpful for all of us. So yeah, oh. we'll see you back. Pleasure. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick, for this presentation with some uh, impressive numbers and also uh, some great insight into understanding really why uh, audio is booming and how and what are the, what are the possibilities uh, and challenges for media organizations and also journalists. <music>